Hi, my name is Heinrich and I wanted to chat to you about my experience over the past 13 years with the American model of heterogeneous group string teaching within a school setting. Like most South African musicians my age, we grew up with a general music program in our schools, which was mostly centered around the teaching of basic music knowledge through singing, the recorder and orf instruments in the lower grades, and heavy on just singing in the higher grades. If one wanted to learn to play an instrument, you signed up and paid for private lessons, either taught at school after hours, or at a music center in your town or city, or of course with a tani around the corner in your neighborhood. I was lucky to be nurtured by fabulous teachers in Vintuk at their music conservatory and consecutively after I moved to Bloemfontein at the Musicon through weekly lessons, a yearly UNISA and Trinity or Royal Schools graded music exam, as well as the annual Eisteddfod or a music festival. I took music as a subject in high school and also joined the Musicon's youth orchestra program. This program had various string and wind orchestras and culminated in a symphonic ensemble, the Free State Youth Orchestra, added with chamber music opportunities arranged by my instrumental teachers and sometimes amongst friends. I left South Africa 16 years ago for Saudi Arabia, where I taught a general music and drama program at a British school. Uh, the music part of my job pretty much was as I grew up with and as I just described. Following that, I was appointed at the Shanghai American School in China, which is really where it all started for me. I spent the next six years teaching elementary and middle school and eventually middle and high school strings and learning as much as I could about heterogeneous string teaching. To say that I was amazed at how well this model worked would be an understatement. I had this imprinted teaching philosophy that the only way to learn to play well was by individual instruction. And although I still greatly value the way of thinking and highly recommend to all my students to have weekly private lessons with an instrument specific specialist, I have to say that there is a lot that can be achieved within a school string classroom. As I moved on to Vienna, Austria and to Orlando, Florida, I was lucky to have had wonderfully supportive colleagues as well as a drive to be a good teacher and an instinct and ability to think on my feet. I might have to mention that I started uh, learning the violin when I was little before I switched to the cello. Um, so in Shanghai, I also started taking a few violin lessons and, and viola lessons, and I spent hours reading and researching this topic. I went to every string teachers conference and seminar there was and, and I was able to afford. Um, the American String Teachers Association, or ASTA, has a national conference held in a different city around the US annually, and it's simply marvelous to come together with like-minded string teachers from all over. A fantastic reference that I can also highly recommend is the Hammond and Gillespie book on Strategies for String Teaching, published by Oxford University Press. I'll leave a link in the comments. Um, I have to add that choosing a good method book is absolutely key. The ASTAS curriculum recommends 13 options to choose from, each with their own unique style and slightly different philosophies around musical and technical development. However, a method book is only as good as the teacher who is using it, as a book cannot put into words everything that is needed to be able to teach effectively. During the 20th century, outstanding pedagogical figures greatly influenced string education. These include Samuel Applebaum, George Barnoff, Elizabeth Green, Paul Rowland, Phyllis Young, and Suzuki. Each was an expert instrumentalist who developed a unique approach to string instruction. Specifically influential to me is the work of Mr. Paul Rowland. He worked tirelessly after being commissioned by the US government in the 1960s to create a string teaching philosophy for both heterogeneous string classes and private lessons. It was broadly based around the idea of making sure the students were started correctly, with freedom of movement, good tone, and accurate intonation. His approach did more than just teach a student to play. It developed a clear understanding of how to play. The board of directors of ASTA identified a need for a current, national, comprehensive, sequential, and practical curriculum for school string classes. And in 2011, the ASTA String Curriculum Committee published the ASTA String Curriculum. The ASTA String Curriculum is organized by scope and sequence. Within the three main categories of executive, musicianship, 
and artistic skills and knowledge, the curriculum presents content areas, achievement standards, and learning tasks. For each learning task, the curriculum provides learning sequences and indicators of success. Here are some practical examples that I found have worked well for me over the years. This is by no means a complete listing, nor is it all of my own original ideas. I found the Asta and online string community tirelessly supportive and generous with resources and, and sharing knowledge. When giving one-on-one -on -one lessons, I would certainly do some things differently, particularly with introducing the left hand, but we're not aiming to replace private lessons, right? So, uh, we're going to focus on the first two years of teaching, um, as I find this is the most rewarding, but it's also the biggest responsibility. It potentially lays the foundation for all future playing and understanding of music. The skills taught need to be carefully presented and reinforced so that the need for remedial instruction in the future years is limited. We are establishing a foundation of good posture, instrument and left hand positions, bowing skill habits and high standards of intonation. It all somehow has to become second nature. It is important to have a routine within your classroom environment. In an ideal world, one does not share a teaching space and the room can be set up to the needs of your particular class. Of course, the reality is that you are going to have to spend some time setting up chairs and stands before the students can get out their instruments. I usually have a seating plan that stays the same for every lesson so that students know exactly what they are going to do. For first and second year classes, uh, I've used a traditional string um, orchestra model in the past, um, but lately I found a row configuration. So I seat the students in instrument order from treble to bass to create a travel path, and it works much better so that I can move easily amongst the students. This way, I can also pay individual attention to each and every student, uh, giving them direct communication, uh, words of encouragement, a correction verbally, or physically adjusting each student at least once a week. Choosing the correct size instrument. The following guidelines are general recommendations. Personally, um, following these, as well as trusting my eyes and instincts, have served me well. For the violin or viola, place the instrument under the student's chin in playing position and have the student grasp the scroll with the left hand. And when they can curve the middle finger around the scroll with the arm slightly bent, this will be the correct size. For the cello, with the student standing, Adjust the length of the end pin so that the scroll is near the height of the player's nose. Then seated, the top of the lower bouts should be about the knee height and the neck block should come up to the student's breastbone. The C-string peg should comfortably fit behind the ear and this is a good opportunity to have students give the cello a hug. Um, this should be comfortable if the cello is well sized and in the correct position. The student should also be able to comfortably play an interval of a minor third between the first and fourth fingers on the string with the left hand. I have to admit that teaching young beginner bassists on, on, a, on an eighth or a quarter bass is one of my favorite things to observe. Uh, to measure bassists, you first adjust the length of the end pin so that the nut of the bass is near the top of the student's forehead when standing. I have the students place their left forefinger on the tip of the nose and the middle finger on the bottom lip. Using this shape on the fingerboard in first position, um, this should be an interval of a major second between this first finger and the fourth finger when the left hand is on the string. As I discussed with all instruments, I double check the span of the left hand fingers. You don't want to set any student up with an instrument that is going to cause tension in the left hand. If in doubt, always go for the smaller instrument. For the violin viola player, it's also necessary to choose the correct size shoulder rest, be it a foam pad or an adjustable shoulder rest. It is worth mentioning that I have influenced many a student that wasn't sure of which instrument to pick to go for the viola or the double bass. We always need more of those in this world. I have even, I am ashamed to say, uh, pretended to observe the most perfect viola or bass fingers I've ever seen in my life uh, to try and sway some choices. As far as instrument care goes, I won't go into too much detail here, but it's important to remind students often and to practice procedures until habits form. 
I usually send written care info home with students, which includes home care. I specifically mention avoiding extreme temperatures, not leaving instruments in vehicles, and of course, a favorite, advising parents never to try and do instrument cleaning or repairs themselves. In these classes, I also teach basic theory and of course, note reading skills. A good method book will include everything, or one can use an additional theory course. While you are setting up one group of students into playing position, have the others working in their books or worksheets, uh, looking at their open strings and clefts for their specific instrument, or any other material you see fit. I also design preparatory exercises and, and checklists for each group, which could be used silently by each student when I choose to focus my attention on a specific group of students. This includes basic exercises, but also precursors to vibrato and shifting. They're called uh, spy glasses and telescopes, uh, bow hand exercises with pencils, or practicing the bunny rabbit, not the fox, rosin bowing, doorknobs, fingerboard taps, tunneling, riding the rails, thumb taps, thumb slides, pullaways, knuckle knocks, shaking the can, finding your elbow, lift set saddle, shuffling feet, and many more exercises. Another great resource, of course, is to use buddy teaching and student leaders. There are many ways to set up a student in playing position with their instrument. The most important aspect is that no matter what instrument you are playing, the back needs to be straight and the instrument fitted around this concept. So for violin violas, I find that this routine works well. I ask the students to stand and step the left foot forward a little then feel completely balanced with soft knees. Um, then they hold the violins or the violas horizontally with their right hand at the tailpiece and uh, the left at the place where the neck joins the body of the instrument. They keep the instrument horizontal and then lift the instrument above their heads um, and then a little bit to the left, like the Statue of Liberty. And then this helps straighten their backs and has them standing or sitting up tall. Then lastly, they lower the instrument slowly and it lands on the shoulder. For the cello students, they should sit on the front half of the chair with their feet flat on the floor and a few inches, inches in front of the chair legs. This affects the positions of the knees. If the left knee ends up too far to the left, then the student will never feel comfortable um, and, and tension will prevail. The tip of the end pin should be placed a little right of center to the student's perspective and the head should not have to move out of the upright position for the scroll. For the early stages with bass players, I prefer to have the right foot on the floor and the left foot on the rung of the stool. The left leg then helps to support the weight of the instrument, giving the student more freedom of movement. Tuning was one of the hardest things I had to learn to manage. Um, I try and check the instruments before the first class so that I can avoid any major issues during the class. I have to say that sometimes one cheats uh, with beginner classes and you only tune the strings that will be used in the actual lesson. So um, the following would take place after I've done the setup phase and demonstrated how to pizzicato. Uh, I have the students play left or right hand pizzicato on each string while you go around the room and tune. Set up the routine with them so that they understand what to do. Ask them to stay on one string until you give them the signal to change to the next. Each lesson, I ask a different student to be a leader or if the process is taking too long, I change the leaders during the process. At the beginning, try to choose the students who can keep a steady beat. To create variety, change, change between left and right hand pizzicato using different fingers. Uh, for violinists, plucking with a left hand, fourth finger on the G string will help with posture. Use a similar process once the students are using their bows. This is a time where you can check bow holds, straight bows, and tone production. So bow holds. Uh, there are many exercises to create a fluid bow hold. The basis for all bow holds is that they should be balanced, the fingers not too tight and not too loose, and with reason, uh, or within reason, for each individual hand, the thumb and the second finger should form a circle. The aim is to produce a rich full tone devoid of too much pressure. I prefer to start the bow as soon as possible. If you want to hold up the, um, the bowing until later, it's best to remove the bows from the cases. Students are very inquisitive and most of them will have a go with the bow 
at home. Uh, and then you have to, of course, undo the damage done. I have used uh, in the past uh, old broken bows that I removed the hair and half of the stick. Um, and I then sent that home as a tool for the initial bow hold practice. A simpler way is, of course, just using a pencil. Uh, usually elementary schools have a thicker yellow pencil that is closer to the thickness of a bow. And this is a great tool I found. I always start with a bunny rabbit, this exercise, and I go from there. Checklists are immensely useful here, as well as modeling and showing short video clips of professional players with conventional bow holds. I make use of a series of bow motions and precursors to bowing using props to aid the learning, like dowels, straws for violins and violas, wooden tongue depressors for cellos, toilet rolls, etc. It's important to install good habits of bow hold and doing exercises where students can maintain the relaxed bow hold throughout. The left hand. I take a lot of time to consolidate the bowing and pizzicato techniques before moving to the left hand. To encourage the use of the left hand, I use lots of left hand pizzicato using any of the fingers in any position on the instruments. There are many reasons to choose which finger you start with. The basic premise for all instruments should be a balanced rounded hand position. To create this, I personally use the third finger for violin viola and fourth finger cello approach as for intonation purposes, I like to match this with the open strings and your bass players can support by playing the appropriate open string. I like the students to start using their ears to create accurate intonation right from the beginning. And this is a good way to create focus and a rounded hand position at the same time. I find it easier to place the rest of the fingers in tune if you start this way. When introducing the double bass left hand, various books give a choice of first position or starting in the next position. Once again, this is a decision, decision you need to make based on your own experience. With bigger classes, I've also used finger tapes on the fingerboard, which helps move things along a little bit faster. I always have my own instrument handy, as well as a piano or electric keyboard to play with or accompany my students. As a cellist, I have found that sitting on a bass stool with a very long spike allows me to play at pitch for each of the instruments. At some point in the process, you will need to assess the student's playing ability. It's not necessary for all students to play a solo. Make sure that you are aware of students who are having difficulty and let the students play in pairs or small groups. I also have found the use of technology a fantastic resource. A simple way is for students to make short videos at home using their phone, their smartphone, and submitting it by email or a sharing platform. Some of the method books now has online platforms that is free with the purchase of the student book. These sites have accompaniments, worksheets, games, but most importantly, students can record themselves with or, with, um, uh, with or without the exercises accompaniment. They can then send this recording to your teacher account where you can listen, grade, and provide feedback. Using more advanced platforms like Smart Music can be pricey, but it's a great way to inspire students to practice and to play using the smart accompaniments within the site. I really prefer doing this uh, for both formative and summative assessments, as it focuses class time on simply teaching and rehearsing and then assessing students' recordings after hours without making use of valuable contact time. Teaching music in school as a heterogeneous string class activity develops important social skills such as social awareness, attentive listening, tolerance and appreciation of others, delaying gratification, ensemble playing as a parallel to teamwork, and belonging to a special group characterized by many shared qualities. Other abilities that may develop is cooperation, responsibility and mutual support, trust and respect, engaging in give and take and reaching compromises. These aspects are but a few worth mentioning, in addition, of course, to the process of learning to play an instrument. I continue to learn and discover new ways of teaching playing skills, inspiring students, learning new repertoire, and introducing the wonders of performing music to students. I hope I could do so for some of you as well. Please feel free to get in touch if there are any questions, or if I could ever be of any help in assisting to set up a program or simply giving advice. Thank you.